I'm sure everyone enjoyed reading Shankaracharya. It's difficult, huh? Find it difficult? Was it the translation that was No, translation is fairly uh, not so bad. Uh, this is a translation from uh, probably about the turn of the century. About the turn of the century. This is a Sacred Books of the East series, George Thibault. Uh, it could be a little more modern, it's true. It's true, but uh, uh, the original material is difficult and compressed, so it's hard to know. Um, um, Anyway, the idea, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, um, parts of this, because you may have noticed, especially in pa on page uh, uh, 326, the paragraph that starts at the bottom, but it may be said, uh, Scripture declares itself in favor of a Brahman capable of modification. Modification means his parinama. That's where he right, gets right into the uh, rejection of Parinama. But it's all part of a larger argument. So, it's all in there. So, if we start with Chaitanya Charitamrita. Text, uh, chapter 7, text 121. Oh, let's just go over a little bit. Let me just see if we can't... Uh, I notice I have my notes to review, so I should view. Just uh, let's get some volunteers. Who can define what a sutra is? Anyone? Yeah? A compressed code to state philosophy. Yeah, right. It's very concise oh, I'm sorry? Very concisely grammatical. Yeah, grammatically correct, very, very compressed or concise. Contains the essence of all knowledge. <laughs> And it says universally applicable. Yeah, I don't know exactly what that means, but this, yeah, grammatically correct. So, what is Vedanta Sutra? Maybe I should ask first, what is Vedanta? End of knowledge. End of knowledge. Huh? Knowledge of Brahman. Uh, also, it's the name of one of the six schools of Indian philosophy called Vedanta Darshan. You know. Hadn't planned on it. Where you can learn about them? Well, uh, geez, I don't know if I can even name them all right off the tip of my uh, head. You know? But anyway, yeah, there's, there's some different places in Prabhupada's purports. They mention it. Yeah, you have a reference? Majjali the twenty five fifty to fifty six. Yeah. You know. The two Mamsas, Nyaya, uh, Vishesha, uh Vaisheshika, excuse me, Vaisheshika. Um, what is the other one? The one that the uh Sankhya. How many is that? To get the two Mamsas. Yeah, and Patanjali Yoga. Yeah. Okay, uh, so Vedanta is one of those. So the Vedanta Sutra are the, the codes that express the Vedanta philosophy, which is the concluding knowledge of the Vedas. Um, anybody can uh, remember the, what is the, the, uh, how, is the, uh, how are the codes of Vedanta structured? What's the organization? I don't know. Lola? Yeah, four adhyayas, each containing four padas. You can call them books and chapters, or chapters and sections, or whatever you want. With the, with the, uh, I forgot to mention that the the, the first two uh, chapters adhyayas uh, are d devoted to sambanda. That is the relationship between the Lord and the living entity. Uh, Sambanda, 
or as far as the Maya, but you know, the discussion of the relation of Brahman and the world and the creation and everything like that. Then the third, is dedicated to Prayojana, or the process of attaining, huh? Excuse me, Abhideya, process of attaining uh, liberation, of acting in the relationship with God from our point of view. And then finally, Prayojana, description of the ultimate goal in the fourth uh, Ajayana. This is mentioned in uh, the purport to 106. Hmm. No, I, uh, as far as I know, it varies. There's uh, about 560 sutras altogether. What are some other names of Vedanta Sutra? The Vedanta Sutras? Brahma Sutra. What else? Any other? Yeah, Uttara Hmm. Sodashipad. Sodashipad. Yeah, Sodashipad. It's also called Sodashipad, yeah. That's not actually one of the, the formal names, but they refer to as Sodashipad, having 16 uh, padas. Mm -hmm. You said Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it explained two different ways. Uh, neither of them from uh, what I would call authoritative sources. <laughs> one, either the temporally one came first and the other came second, or that one is lower and the other is higher, or that in the sequence of spiritual development one is first and one is second. You know. Uh, yeah. Concerning this point in Shmadvaya, I guess Shia Prabhupada is writing about the Vedanta philosophy as being first propounded by Ashtavaka. Is there any scriptural references for that? And he's saying that this was before Shankar. Uh, yeah, that's, I remember that, that place where he says that. Um, but uh, I don't know anything more about Ashtavakra. I haven't run across it anywhere else. Uh, What's the meaning of uh, prashtana triya? Anybody know that? You know? This is the three uh, uh, sources of knowledge, shastic mm -hmm. sources of knowledge. Then, then there's... Uh, get yeah, tell me what they are. Um, Shruti prashtan, shmiti prashtan, and naya prashtan. And each, what they mean? Um, well, Shruti is the original Vedas and the Upanishads. Shmiti is the Puranas and Mahabharata. Supplementary riches. Uh, Naya Prashtan is um, the Vedanta Sutra. Mm -hmm. And what about these terms? That's good. Uh, Mukya and Gona Vritti. Do you know those, Arjun? <coughs> Mukya Vritti is the direct meaning, and Gona Vritti is the indirect meaning. Mm -hmm. Indirect meaning. You know some uh, other synonyms for these terms? Yeah? What? <coughs> Name for Mukya Vritti is Abhidha Vritti. Yeah, Abhidha. And for Gona? Lakshana. Lakshana, yeah. Lakshana Vritti. Okay. And I'm glad we understand this, these things. Okay. So text 121. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, In his Vedanta Sutra, Srila Vyasadeva has described that everything is but a transformation of the energy of the Lord. So that's in 1426. You should have a copy of that with Shankaracharya's purport. Uh, I don't have a copy right now. Could somebody lend me a copy? Okay. Thank you. That's uh, 1426. Brahman is the material cause, that is, of the world. You have it also here, Atmakrite. Uh, on account of making itself, atma krite, uh, uh, this is possible, parinamat, by parinama. So there the word parinama is right here in the sutra, that Brahman is the material cause. Material cause means the substance of the world. You make a distinction between efficient cause. If I, you know, give this chalk a, uh, a roll, I'm the efficient cause of making that chalk roll. But the material cause of this chalk is, uh, 
you know, some uh, chalk cliff somewhere, however they get this stuff, you know, where it comes from. Just as the example is the material cause of, of a clay pot is the clay, whereas the efficient cause will be the potter. You see, so he's, this, is, this is saying that Brahman is the material cause of the world. The world emanates from Brahman. Atma, how, why, how does he do that? Parinama. So what we say here is that if you look at Shankaracharya's purport, no dispute. He just cites all kinds of scriptural references in support of the fact that Brahman is the material cause of the world. Uh, no argument. He quotes the Upanishads that made itself uh, anyway, he doesn't dispute it. I just wanted everybody to see that. There it is. Atmakte parinamat. And there it is. It's, so when he says, Vyasadeva says it, that's just exactly what Vyasadeva says. It's right in the sutra. But then he says, Shankaracharya, however, not accepting the energy of the Lord, thinks that it is the Lord who is transformed. He has taken many clear statements from the Vedic literature and twisted them to try to prove that if the Lord of the Absolute Truth were transformed, His oneness would be disturbed. Thus he has accused Srila Vyasadeva of being mistaken. That's the effect of it anyway. In developing his philosophy of monism, you know that monism, oneness, therefore he has established Vivartavada, or the Mayavad theory of illusion. So the real theory is Parinama Vada, theory or doctrine, Vada. And specifically, if you want to be precise, Shakti Parinama Vada, the doctrine of the transformation of energies. And the Mayavad theory is Vivarta Vada. Although it will be explained a little later on, there's a legitimate use of Vivarta. Uh, uh, in the in the scripture, but they take it and use it for something else. So this is their theory. Now, if we look at this purport of what Shankaracharya does here, this is the text uh, two two one fourteen, which says that the non difference of Brahman in the world. Uh, is established in those verses of the Chandogya Upanishad which begin with the word Arambana. Hmm? Have you finished to discuss 26? The first uh, point? Because he said he agrees with the point, it doesn't make a point. Yeah. But it seems to me that he supports Brahman but doesn't develop Parinama. He says, uh, rather, he avoids the question by saying, as far as Parinama, it can also be taken as a second sutra. He doesn't really discuss the relation between Brahman and the energies coming from Iran and push it. So put he just doesn't deal with it. He, you know, he just doesn't discuss it at all. The, he says it's not a sutra. He said, no, he takes it. He said, you can. If you first reading is, he doesn't say, he said, it may also be taken as a separate sutra. Uh, But it doesn't. But it just says there's two ways of reading it. He doesn't. That doesn't make a difference, is it? huh? The first part doesn't really assess uh, the, the effects of the Brahman as as coming from Parinamat. I mean, it doesn't state it there. Yeah, it does. So, but how can the self, which is as agent, which as agent was in full existence previous to the action, be made out to be? At the same time, that which is effect of the action. How can the self be both the cause and the effect? Owing to parinama, we reply. You see, there it is. Owing to parinama. The self, although in full existence previous to the action, modifies itself into something special, namely the self of the, expect, of the effect. This V-I-Z is always read as namely. Uh, Thus we see that causal substances such as clay and the like are by undergoing the process of modif modification changed into their products. as clay and it becomes a clay pot. That's what he's saying. So he totally, you know, there's no argument. 
That's because he won't contradict Vyasadeva right here. He waits a little later and then does it. It would be unseemingly to argue with the, with, with the sutra. But when he gets to the same example of the clay pot here, he denies the existence of effects. That's what he does. He then distorts the meaning of this Upanishad verse to actually deny the existence of effects. It says they're products of speech only. They're products of speech only. Now, I have appended here to this sheet Ramanujacharya's understanding of this verse because the example is given here where this Udalaka is talking to his son, Sveta Ketu. I'm going to tell you that knowledge by which, you know, uh, what is not heard can be heard, what is unseen can be seen, and so on. As by one clod of clay, all that is made of clay is known, the difference being only a name arising from speech, but the truth being that all is clay, and so on. He goes from clay, and then gold, and then iron. Uh, he gives these examples here. So what this, so Shankaracharya takes this uh, passage that that it declares the unreality of modifications. For these modifications, that is to say, the clay pot or whatever, or effects are names only. I'm reading here at the bottom of three twenty exist through or originate from speech only, while in reality there is no such thing as a modification. <coughs> now here's, here's, a, here's a man explaining Brahman to his son, right? And he's using as an example clay and a clay pot. And what he's telling his son is clay pots don't exist. That's how we understand Brahman. No, he doesn't say clay pots don't exist. He's saying that if you know a lump of clay, you'll know the substance of all clay pots. If you know iron, you know what all iron things are made out of. If you know gold, you'll know what all gold things are made out of. The same substance is there, although they've undergone modifications. That's what he's saying. He doesn't declare that pots don't exist. That's what Shankaracharya wants to read into this. How can that be? That means that the Upanishad is saying that if you want to carry water, a lump of clay will do. If you want to cut your fingernails, a lump of iron will do. It doesn't say that at all. This doesn't explain the unreality of all effects. It just explains how everything is Brahman. So this is the way Ramanuja takes it. When he says, arising from speech, he says it arises on account of activities which are preceded by speech, like get water in a pot. That's the difference. Hmm. Jars and other things of clay are clay. They're made of the substance of clay only. And he reads this word uh, satyam, and this is true, uh, as referring to, that's the only thing you can deduce by this means of proof. At clay. If you look at clay, then you know what you can tell is that all things are made of clay. You can't tell anything about what, what kind of pitcher they are, whether they're broad-based or narrow-based, whether they have a thin neck or a fat neck. No, 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 those things you can know. But you can know the substance, clay. But to get from this that it declares the unreality of all effects is really twisting the text around. Yeah? Well, apparently he's quoted some slogans from I guess it's the Upanishad uh, to support. This same one, Chandogya Upanishad, somewhere over there. Uh, they use it to support, he uses it to support his idea that its origin is in speech. Uh, and then on, on the other side, on page 321, he says, uh, being a mere name which has its origin in speech, well, I guess it's, he uses that to support his idea. But it doesn't, you know. That's just not true. 
It originates in speech because by speech the pot was made, by speech you use it, by speech you, it undergoes transformation. But it doesn't say. I mean, Prabhupada uses the same argument when people say it's all one. He says, why don't you wear a wad of cotton instead of a shirt? You know, it's not a one. So this from the Chandogya Upanishad, you can't get this out of there, but he does. So anyway, this is his. This is uh, what he what he starts with by saying. So the phrase "as clay they are true." This is on page three twenty two in the middle. Asserts the causes only to be true, while the phrase "having its origin in speech" declares the unreality of all effects. Uh. So that's his, that's, his, uh, that's his case there, based on script. Then he has different arguments uh, and defends it against various sorts of objections as we go on. Maybe we don't have to get into those here. But, yeah? About this verse of the Chandogya Upanishad starts, we can hear what we cannot not be heard, perceive what cannot be perceived, know what cannot be known. That's the introduction of the Chandogya Upanishad itself that you put in there. Mm-hmm. So what is the relation with the example he gives? Because by our experience, uh, when we want to know about something, we take a, that's the, the modern scientific approach. If you want to know about something, you take a sample. Mm -hmm. that, and mm -hmm. What is so specific in the approach of uh, um, the, the way to perceive reality? It seems, it seems a normal way to... I mean, at least to our experiences, it's the normal way to do, even for modern scientists. Mm -hmm. Is it the track? Mm -hmm. So why why I don't perceive the is there a spiritual meaning or is this a Well it's an example. So that the example is going to be that if you know one thing, Brahman, then everything else is known. That's what I mean this is just an excerpt from the Upanishad, you know. I don't, I don't have the whole discourse there, and I don't really want to give, try to under, give a whole purport to the Chandogya Upanishad, which I've never studied that closely. But I just want to show you that, that there's another way to read it. Here you can see from Ramanuja Charja, because it goes on. Uh, so. If you look at page 326, he raises the objection. Scripture itself, by quoting the parallel instances of clay and so on, declares itself in favor of Brahman capable of modification. That's what Scripture says. For we know from experience that clay and similar things do undergo modification. This objection, we reply, is without force because of a number of scriptural passages by denying all modification of Brahman teach it to be absolutely changeless. Kutashta. That word's also in the Bhagavad Gita. Kutashta. The soul is described as kutashta. So, let me see. And then he goes on, page three, he goes on about this a little bit, quoting Strastra. Page 328. But is it, object, it is objected. He who maintains the nature of Brahman to be changeless. Uh, thereby contradicts the fundamental tenet according to which the Lord is the cause of the world. And then he states his two, what I'm going to call his two-tiered theory. But he denies, in here, we'll see, I can't find the place right now, he denies this
So he rejects Parinama because Brahman is changeless. Now this is what Prabhupada is saying in here, right? That he thinks that on the basis that that Shankaracharya thinks that if Brahman, uh, if the world was created by Parinama, then it would qualify the unchanging nature of Brahman. See, that's why he rejects this. There are so many texts that say Brahman doesn't change. So that uh, if that doctrine is, is propounded, then you compromise these texts. So the answer is no. You have to understand Parinama correctly. Hmm? And he says the correct understanding is uh, given as uh, well, there's two things that, that he quotes. One is the mantra from the uh, uh, Om Purna Madat Purnamidam Purnat Purnam Udachate. We have at the invocation, the issue of Upanishad. It's also in other Upanishads. Uh, that, was quote, uh, that was already quoted. How so many things can emanate from Brahman, but he's not disturbed. Uh, that's what, he's so purna, he's so perfect and complete that even though so many complete units come out of him, he remains complete. So if energies come out, uh, he's not disturbed. But then the other one is the idea that he is not changed at all, that there's Brahman and his energies, and his energies undergo change and transformation, while he himself remains unchanged. Shakti Paranama. Uh, and so, I'm not quite sure of the relationship of these, I just have to tell you this, I'm not quite sure of the relationship of these two arguments. There's distinct ones. One, that he, so many things can emanate from him, but he remains undisturbed. Uh, and the other one is that these energies undergo change and he doesn't change because it's just it's the energies and not Krishna himself that undergo change. That's the other one. Uh, I, uh, anyway, those are the two. There, I'm, I have some problems understanding whether they're really uh, how how exactly they're compatible, because the second one doesn't depend upon an idea of, of emanation at all. Uh, that the energy Brahman is there and his energies are there and his energies undergo change, and at least according to Ramanuja, when the energies are reabsorbed. They go into a very, very, very subtle state, but it always remains his material energy. Like during the, the during the the, uh, the pralaya, or during the, the 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 you know the period, the inbreeding period of Mahavishnu, when all the energies are reabsorbed, so material nature gets down into a very, very fine state of pradhan. And this pradhan is the energy of Krishna and it's extremely subtle. But it always remains a separate, separate energy and then it evolves out again. And then it comes back. So the Brahman himself never changes but this energy becomes... And, and, and Ramanuja says so subtle that you can't practically distinguish between it and, 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 and Brahman itself. But still it remains distinct. I've never heard Prabhupada discuss it. You know, this is what this is what here in Prabhupada's literature. I know Prabhupada liked Ramanujacharya a lot. I used to read him. <laughs> so no, that, as far as we know, the energies always exist. There's always Krishna, and there's Krishna's energy. So far as I know, this is compatible with what I've heard from Srila Prabhupada, even though he hasn't exactly discussed this particular point. That there's always Krishna and always Krishna's energies. And we also well, that's an, that's another point. That's another point. But it never seems like you know that that the that these energies uh, you know actually come out of Brahman, which which purna purna muda that, that that seems to indicate that you know Krishna actually loses some kind of the Brahman actually loses some substance, but he never diminishes. That, I'm just a little unclear on that point. Anyway, nobody's ever going to figure, you know, question you about that. So there's... <laughs> no, these are, these are our arguments. No, come on. These are, I mean, you've got to understand who's arguing here. 
Because a lot of devotees have read this and they get the conclusion that Parinamavada is wrong. Just from reading, you know, how they misunderstand it. No, no, these are our arguments. Our arguments are that by Shakti Parinamavada, it does not entail that Brahman is changed. It does not entail that Brahman is changed. He is still Kutashta. See, Shankaracharya says, if transformation were true, then Brahman would be changed. The answer is no. And look, after all, Vyasadeva himself says, Parinamat. And, you know, and Shankaracharya waits until the next pada to deny it. And then when it says, well, this means God couldn't be the creator, he says, yep. That's right. And then he goes on and elaborates his, you know, two-tiered theory. That there are two Brahmans, a higher Brahman, who's the object of knowledge, and the so-called lower Brahman, who's the object of ignorance. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Brihad Aranyaka. Uh -huh. There is no diversity. And then apparently, are we to understand Ramanuja's reputation of that by saying that there are. It's, 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 it's the end of this thing, he says, This is only true, Satyam, known through authoritative means of proof, only Eva, because the effects are not known as different substances. Yeah, that's right. This is only trying to establish. You see, because there's another argument. You see, this. All this business in the Vedanta Sutra is, is, uh, is there to show that the world isn't produced by another substance. If you know clay, what's, what's true when you know clay, you know the substance of all other clay pots, that there's not some other substance coming in. So the world is made of nothing but Brahman. But now, all the, the, all the, now look, there, there are all kinds of passages in the Upanishads, which talk about oneness and identity. Because, and that's what Shankaracharya pulls out. Uh, no one's arguing that. Because oneness is a fact. It is also a fact. But as you see here from this example from the Chandogya Upanishad, that you have oneness when you abstract. And you're just talking about as substances, as what they're made of. You ignore you know, there are various shapes and forms. And then there's oneness, what you've abstracted from. So in a sense, if we just talk about the quality of all the jivas, they're one. As long as we're on the qualitative platform and we're just talking about quality, yeah, it's one. As long as you talk about my quality and Krishna's quality, we're one. No doubt about it. And there are many, many passages that simply focus on this qualitative oneness. There are other passages that, you know, talk about difference. Nityo nityana chetanas chetanana. That says there's two categories of eternal conscious beings. One category is singular. Nitya chetana, it's singular. A set with only one member. That's the category of God. He's one without a second. The other category, nityanam, chetananam, multiple without limit. And what's the difference? Eko bahunam yo vidadatikaman. The one is independent, supplying everything. The many are dependent, receiving all supplies and sustenance from the one. But the one doesn't receive sustenance from anyone else. That passage is there too. So what do you do? Here you have some passages that talk about difference. Here you have some passages that talk about oneness. Now what Shankara says, we're going to take these passages that talk about oneness. That's going to be the real thing. And when they talk about difference, essentially they're lying. <laughs> they're talking from the point of view of ignorance. That is to say, the scriptures are full of ignorance. Huh? They're going to be talking about ignorance. Now we have another way of reconciling these two things. Uh, we say when they talk about oneness, uh, they're, they're abstracting with respect to quality. And when they talk about difference, uh, then they're bringing in, uh, bringing in the uh, numerical distinctions and so on. So they're just different. Well, who, now, who makes 
the most sense out of Scripture with the least amount of strain, the least amount of uh, distortion, the least amount of difficulty. Who can handle it better? So this is uh, with regard to Vedanta Sutra. This is Chaitanya's case, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's case. So we're going to accept. We're going to accept this as. Uh, that the Lord has energies and the, He's created the world, and see what kind of sense we make out of things. Because you see what we see what Shankaracharya has to do. He has to deny that sutra, sutra atma kate parinamat. He has to reject it. But what he's but he's got his system. Whenever you get a sutra like that, he has to say this this sutra is speaking from the point of view of nescience. Now look what you can do with that, you see. Once you say that there's two, sometimes there's Brahman talking about as an object of knowledge and sometimes talking about as an object of nescience, and then you just pick and choose. And that's what he does. He sets up this, uh, this two-tiered system. Anyway, let's go on. And let's dis we'll get to this two-tiered system a little later on here. Let's talk about this Vivarta, Vada. Uh, there's two words that the Mayavadis use to explain Vivarta. I don't remember these words. Ajaropa, and a synonym for this is Ajasa. Illusory superimposition. Vivarta means the doctrine of illusion, but more specifically, it's superimposition, uh, which is defined in uh, by Sadananda Yogendra in the Vedanta Sara. He says, Adyaropa is the superimposition of the unreal on the real, like the false perception of a snake in a rope, which is not a snake. This is the standard example. You go into a dark room and suddenly you see a snake. You actually, you see a snake. You ever had this experience? You see a snake. You see all the details and everything and then you blink and it's a rope. Uh, or the other one is of seeing of silver in mother of pearl. Shankaracharya defines it as the apparent recognition of something previously observed in something else. The appearance of silver and mother of pearl or water in a mirage. Uh, so this is what happens. Is say he comes along with an, uh, this idea of vivarta. The, the existence of the world is explained as a vivarta, an illusory superimposition. When Brahman all the things become an object of nescience or ignorance, then they're seen uh, differences and uh, duality. And he says here, you know, at the very last sentence of 329, the Vedanta texts declare that for him who has reached the state of truth and reality, the whole apparent world does not exist. It does not exist. Uh, 329, very last sentence. So that's their idea. Here Prabhupada in 116, he quotes the slogan, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman is Satyam, is true. Jagan, the material world, Mitya, it's false, illusory. Uh, it's Mitya. That's the slogan. It's an illusory superimposition. The Brahman is real, but you look at it and you see something else. You see variety. Uh, like seeing a, a, a snake where the rope is actually there. Hmm? 
So it's ignorance, it's nescience. The Mayavad philosophers have propagated the slogan Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya, which declares that the absolute truth is fact, but the cosmic manifestation and the living entities are simply illusions. Or that all of them are in fact the absolute truth and the material world and living entities do not exist separately. So it really doesn't exist. That's how you deal with it. That's his whole big uh, thing. Questions so far? Where did you just read? Uh, the purport to, uh, the purport to 121. It was on the in page one sixteen. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five, six paragraph. It is therefore to be concluded, seventh paragraph, that Shankaracharya <coughs> in order to present the Supreme Lord, the living entities and the material nature as indivisible and ignorant tries to cover the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because, as we saw earlier from, uh, from Vedanta Sara, that when you're looking at things from the point of view of ignorance, then the idea of a God related to the world comes out. From the point of view of ignorance, there's God, uh, Ishwara, who produces a world. So not only is the world uh, Mitya and the living entities Mitya, but also God himself is Mitya. So anytime you talk about Brahman as having effects, you're dealing with the realm of ignorance. That's not Brahman. Brahman is one without a second. He's the absolute. As soon as you say there's Brahman in a world, oh, then you're dealing in relativities because he's related to the world. So the real Brahman the high Brahman, the Brahman who's the object of, of knowledge, there's, that he's one alone. One without a second. That's how they understand one without a second. We understand one without a second to mean he has no one in the same category. There's God and God alone in a class by himself. They understand to mean there's Brahman and there's no other thing besides him. This is the absolute. As soon as there's a world or creatures, then he's related. Relative. Relative is bad, absolute is good. And so we there's no such thing in the idea of a transcendental relativity that, that they they reject completely. So you know. Lord, um, to and the world. Hmm? Yeah, Brahman in the world. And then it's a per, then a person. As soon as there's a world, a creation, then God is a person. But as soon as we talk about Brahman, without any distinction, without any varieties described only as neti neti, then there's no world. There's nothing aside from himself for him to be related to. No creatures, no world, no knower, no object of knowledge. And this you'll see, this two-tiered system, is described very nicely here in uh, one one eleven. Hmm? At the uh, last paragraph on the page, Brahman is apprehended under two forms. You don't have this copy of this. <laughs> I just have to get it for me later, I guess. Brahman is apprehended under two forms. In the first place, is qualified by limiting conditions. Sanskrit word is upadi. Upadis. Owing to the multiformity of evolution of name and form. That is the multiformity of the creative world, created world, there should be a close parenthesis. In the second place is being the opposite of this, free from all limiting conditions whatsoever. See, as soon as there's a world, there's a limitation on God. God is the unlimited, right? So if there's a creation, then he's a this and a not that, and therefore limited. Well, how do you defeat that? <laughs> anyway, that's their argument. Huh? So no creation. Can't be. That would limit him. Huh? But we also that. That's true. Yeah. Actually, it's true. God is one without a second. There's nothing but Krishna and Krishna's energies, and together they describe the absolute truth. 
That's if there isn't, and there's nothing but Sri Krishna. That's also our philosophy. So we, we, we take account of that too. But anyway, this is their idea. So then he gives some scriptural passages, which I'm going to skip over. All these passages, 62, which, with many others, declare Brahman to possess a double nature. Notice this, a double nature. According as it is the object either of knowledge or nescience. Nescience just simply means ignorance. As long as it is the object of nescience, there are applied to it the categories of devotee, object of devotion, and the like. Then he goes on a little about uh, being devoted in different ways and what you get out of it. Yeah. The, none of them, the, some of them can lead to gradual emancipation. But it's important to notice that actually knowing the lower Brahman does not free you. Knowing God, being a devotee of God, does not release you from birth and death and material world because you're still in the realm of ignorance. It can lead you gradually, you know, that finally, ultimately, you come into knowledge and understand that I am God. Uh, but. Uh, it doesn't lead to release. As long as it's the object of ignorance, then you get these categories. Object of devotion, devotee, act of worship. They're all mitya. So that's, it has this double nature as an object of nescience and an object of... This is his two-tiered system, see? This is his two-tiered system. Yeah, they're, they're thinking it's yeah. They're, they're completely convinced all devotional service is material. They write books about it sometimes. Yeah, that's fine because you can do that. You can do that. You know, Shankaracharya says here. If you look back to this one, two one fourteen. Uh, which you should read again tonight. That'll be the reading. Just read it one more time. <laughs> You got to read these a lot. I mean, you know, like philosophers, you know, like university philosophers, they read everything they deal with, they read 15, 20 times, you know. This is not uncommon at all. I'll outline it for you here. But here he says the objection is raised to his position. Uh, page 323. Other objections are stated. He states his position in 323. He then deals with objections. First, if we acquiesce in the doctrine of absolute unity, the ordinary means of right knowledge, perception, etc. become invalid because the absence of manifoldness deprive them of their objects. Moreover, all the text, I skip a sentence, embodying injunction and prohibitions will lose their purport if the distinction on which their validity depends does not really exist. That is all the Shastra, everything. It's all unreal. And further, the entire body of doctrine which refers to final release will collapse if the distinction of teacher and pupil on which it depends is not real. And if that's unreal, how can the doctrine of the final unity of the self be real? Two, three, twenty-three, three, twenty-four. Right. Then he says, "These objections do not damage our position because the entire complex of phenomenal existence is considered as true as long as the knowledge of Brahman, being the self of all, has not arisen." In other words, he's got ignorance is a kind of truth. As long as you don't have this absolute unity, then you have to consider it all as true. So he's got a double theory of truth going. Huh? Hey, look, this is one of the great, you know, world philosophers. You think this is bad. Where do you get to the Buddhist stuff? 
People, all the people believe this. They believe this. Allen Ginsberg believes it. You know, people believe this. They believe words are meaningless. I mean, I, they come to the temple and they say words are meaningless. You know, I mean, uh, you know, this is what's going on. So, so, but notice this, by the way. Now, look, when you read this again, look at what he's doing. He states the objection, and then it, it has two parts. One is that the karma kanda section of the Vedas will be invalid, and two that the jnana kanda section of the Vedas will be invalid. The injunctions and prohibitions refer to the karma kanda, and final release will be unobtained. Uh, deals with the jnana kanda section of the Vedas, right? So anyway, but here he states basically there's this double truth. This theory of double truth. This he gets from the Buddhist, but this is a Buddhist idea too. Two truths. The doctrines of two truths. The truth, uh, of the truth in quotes of avidya. It's to be considered at, as long as you're in maya, it's true. I remember sitting, I mean, sitting on a lawn sometime with some college kids, and they were telling her, this lady about Krishna, this girl about Krishna. And, you know, she said, oh, I think it's a beautiful idea, something like that. And we said... And we said something about it's not just beautiful, it's true. She said, well, it's true for you. If you believe it's true, it's true for you. Because the basic thing is it's all fictions anyway. And pick your fiction. Now you see, according to Shankaracharya, there's only one established fiction. Shankaracharya's thing is, this whole realm of, if you're in Maya, say if you're in ignorance... Then the world of ignorance, there's God, there's the Vedas, there's the world emanating from God, there's, there's the injunctions, there's one single established system of ignorance. But now we live in the days of social and cultural relativity. Now it's everybody's got their own little system of ignorance. The Kwakudal, that's an Indian tribe, they have their system of ignorance, and the J Japanese have their system of ignorance, and you Hare Krishna devotees, you have a very beautiful system of ignorance, and you can pick your maya. And if, it's tr if, if you believe that it's true, it's true for you. Right. Because since the time of Shankaracharya, you know, the, the, the idea that there should be one fixed system of illusion, now we have relatives, relativities, more relativities are in. They do, there's no, because Shankaracharya here is accepting the authority of the Vedas. It's much more of a Buddhist idea that you can, you can pick your illusions. Because in the Mahayana's Buddhist, the idea when they when they when they uh, there's a notion in there that that actually many of the scriptures are or s Buddhist stories are actually conscious fictions. Uh, whereas uh, uh, anyway, that's another thing. But but uh, so this this idea gets around a lot. Anyway, then he gives ideas. How can Vedanta true? Text, if untrue, convey information about the true being of Brahman. And then, I, we don't have time to get into this, but he really doesn't handle... This is, this is a decisive objection, actually. The Vedic scriptures deal with name and form, and therefore uh, are in the realm of avidya, or nescience. Then what about this distinction between Brahman with qualities and Brahman without qualities. That's the other, you know, terms that are used sometimes. The way he uses Saguna Brahman and Nirguna Brahman. Instead of saying the product of ignorance, he calls this, this objection raised, he just calls it untrue. I mean, according to what I've understood, this objection that he's raising, he just quoted, but how, to restate an objection raised above, can the Vedanta texts, if untrue, in other words, a product of ignorance, is what yeah, understood. Right. How, if they, can, if they are untrue, can they convey information about the true being of Brahman? Right. That's what you're going to answer? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, he, I, don't, I don't have time to go through all that. Maybe I'd be able to do in this course, deal with his answer to this. Because his answer is basically, his argument is that, is that real effects come from unreal causes. You know, that's what, that's what, and he gives a lot of examples. Now you sit and you take, the first one is that sometimes people have been bitten by snakes in dreams and actually die. 
<laughs> he gives a series of instances. Anyway, they can be taken apart. But, it, but, but, if, but this distinction between Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman is itself a duality. So that means you, if you have this idea of Brahman without qualities, that can only be understood in contradistinction to the Brahman, Brahman with qualities. It's a relative idea. This is Prabhupada's argument in the Isha Upanishad. These negations are only the opposite numbers of the relative qualities, names, and forms, and therefore itself also relative. That's Prabhupada's argument. As far as I can see, it's decisive. And he doesn't really deal with it in this form. If you describe, you want to describe the absolute, and you describe it in terms of negation, of the relative qualities, names, and forms. Those negations are also relative. If I say something, if I say red, right? And then I say not red, there's a symbol for not. The idea of not red depends on its meaning for red. If I say qualities and I say no qualities, that depends, these denials depend on what they deny for their meaning. So it's, it's, the, the denials are also relative. That's why the Buddhists say you cannot say red, even Nah, that's right. That's why the Buddhists say. You can't say you can't say red. You can't say not red. You can't say both red and not red. You can't say neither. You know, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you want to cover everything. <laughs> so therefore, you see, this idea without qualities is a relative idea. This nirguna. Idea. So what, what the system does is since it all depends, uh, I mean here you have discursive thought which aims at, dis, at describing, some, which aims at really telling you that all discursive thought is illusory. So what's the, it self-destructs, you know, a rational thought, one idea sequence after another. I mean, one thing about this Mayavad philosophy, they're gyanis, you know, but it's so anti-intellectual when it comes down to, because really it's saying that all thinking, all knowledge, all words, all rationality is maya. It's really anti, and we're the ones who are supposed to be emotional and everything, you know, bhavakas. <laughs> but, but actually, in, in, in the, our system, you know, rational thought has a, has, has a firm place in the ontology, in, in existence. But to them, it actually has got no place. So things turn out to be just the opposite of what they, what they appear. The so-called Ghanis, really, you know, they're really into this mental thing, but what they want is the destruction of mentality. Can I ask you a question, page 330, in the verses of Bhagavad Gita, to, to show that there is no difference between, that there is no rumor. Mm -hmm. At the top of the page, uh -huh. it says, uh, there's no ruler and rule. But uh, Bhagavad Gita 5.14 it says, The Lord is not the cause of action or of the capacity of performing action. But in Shia Prabhupada's translation, it's not the Lord, it's the soul. Mm -hmm. The soul doesn't... In the first mm -hmm. verse for 5.14 it's You look these up, huh? Yeah. Good. And, and then the next one, it says, The Lord receives no sin or merit. So it was the two verses to show that there's no difference between the, the soul and, and God, actually. Mm -hmm. That's right. But in the Bhagavad Gita, they say it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, this is how Shankara reads it, you know. Yeah, but in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that the Lord is uh, transcendental to, he's not affected by his, by the karma, or, but here he just writes that <coughs> uh, the Lord is not the cause of actions or the capacity, or of the capacity of performing actions. That's meant to be the soul in the, in the, in the verse, anyway. But to Shankaracharya, they're the same, right? What is the Sanskrit of that text? Anybody know of him? Well, there's no Atma, there's no soul in there. Uh -huh. It's referring to the previous verse, uh -huh. which are dealing with the... Uh -huh. It's time to go, folks. Here's our next uh, teacher. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll continue this discussion tomorrow. Okay, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah.